through all throughout high school. Um, I kind of knew that I wanted to be an artist in some degree. Uh, for a while, I had my sights set uh, on being um, in a studio setting somewhere. Um, I really wanted to work for Blizzard for a while, be in, be in a studio setting at Blizzard. Uh, and then as I went more and more into it, I realized that my real love um, was with Dungeons and Dragons. That's really what got me into art to begin with, uh, those old manuals. And, uh, and I started pursuing a career as a freelance illustrator and freelance concept artist. Um, I trained a little bit at community colleges, a little bit at four-year universities. None of those really kind of meshed up with, um, with what I wanted to do with my skills or where I wanted to take my skills. Uh, so I ended up finding something uh, uh, known as an atelier, which is a, a, a school based off of the old European style of, um, of learning the arts. So um, a lot of drawing uh, from life. I don't know if life. I'm the one who, who lost you a bit, uh, but we're not hearing you. Oh, can you hear me? Am I there? No worries, no worries. Technology, right? It's great until it isn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, me? one one of the things that I uh, I was talking with with Tom is that he he he's one of the artists from from D and D, and our art director for from Dragon Bond, which is great because thanks to him we have. Uh, some of our greatest assurances I have here. Aureus, I know that I show him a lot, but he's my favorite. So until some can uh, fix the audio issue, look at his radiant majesty, right? So this one was, uh, it's also painted. Well, and it's also one of the dragons that we have for plastic. One of my here. favorites um, as well. I'm the, I can't hear you, Tom. I'm not sure can't hear if me the still? audio isn't coming. Oh, I can hear you now. Great. You can hear me now? We Sorry for that. <laughs> So it's stop talking no, about me. I'm so sorry. Uh, so let's continue we're good. with this. Uh, the next question for this one was, so here, uh, well, after all the artists think, what caught your attention about Dragon Bond? Oh, man. So um, uh, what caught my, oh, man, that's a, that's a loaded question and a long story. Um, let oh, me go man. ahead so, and, and um, think about where to start uh, with that one. What? So... Dragon Bond first kind of came to my attention uh, uh, several years ago at Gen Con. Uh, I had a booth at Gen Con, and um, and a couple guys came up to my booth, really excited about this project that they were working on. And uh, and the first thing that they they said was, "It's about dragons." And uh, and honestly, that's all you need to say to get me hooked to start with. Uh, just say something's about dragons, and I'm and I'm on board. So uh, they said, "Hey, drop us a line after the show. We'd love to talk with you." Uh, that ended up being, uh, you know, Will and and Danny and Pam and and Daniel, uh, all all these guys that I ended up working with over at uh, and got to know with Dragon Bond um, were that that small group that kind of came up uh, to me at Gen Con that first time uh, when we were talking and um, and as we started talking after the convention and started getting into the Dragon Bond setting a little bit more, I realized that there was something really special about that setting uh, for me. Like I said, the first thing that got me was somebody saying, hey, let's make dragons. And I got really excited about that. But then as we peeled back the layers of this setting and I realized what it was about, um, it's not just about dragons. What's awesome about this setting is it's, it's, about, uh, it, it's, it's about looking at the fantasy experience, the fantasy setting through a, a different lens. Um, this, this kind of bridging gaps uh, aspect to this setting is, um, a, a, is what I love about it. You have these different factions that are all, uh, you know, opposed to each other. But then you have people in those factions that are reaching out to, to one another and, and to try to build bridges while in the midst of these battles and everything. And, uh, and I love that. I love the diversity that we've created in this setting. And, uh, and I love the, the, just the, the, the weirdness of it, to be honest. It's a weird, unique setting, which is uh, part of what I love about it. There's a lot of settings that are kind of safe. Um, when, and, and let me try to explain what I mean when I say it's a, to be honest. It's a a different setting. Yeah, there's can, a lot of. Yeah, yeah there's a lot. Of I can imagine that because I'm in love with the with the dragons itself. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, uh, uh, so here's one of the, the the hard questions for 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 you. So what is your which one is your favorite Ashurma like Aureus, Bastarox? Uh, which one do you enjoy the most? Uh, painting it and doing it and bringing him to life. So for me, out of all the dragons that we've designed, there's like I said before, they're kind of weird off the off the beaten path designs for some of these, you know, and that's what I, what I really love about this setting is that they embrace that. So for me, I love the weirder dragons. Uh, Cuxquadle is one of my favorites. Uh, it was the first one I designed up for, uh, 
for Draco and for Dragon Bond on this beautiful uh, ancient worm that uh, has this feathered look that's, uh, that's evocative of the Mesoamerican Quetzalcoatl, uh, Quetzalcoatl um, from mythology. So that was a, just a blast to design up. Uh, on the other side of things, though, um, I'm a huge, like, obviously, I love traditional dragons. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of old school stuff. So Bestherox is probably my second favorite one. Uh, he's got that old school kind of heavy dragon uh, feel to him. You know, he's got those big scales, big horns, big teeth, uh, and is kind of just your your typical medieval dragon, but kind of taken up a notch. So uh, so he's kind of second on my on my list. But the first one, I, I love things that are a little weird, a little different. So Cuxquaddle with all of his fun feathers is is definitely my favorite. A weird little different. I think so one of the questions Cuxquaddle that I also have uh, that I'm hearing here from the from our people, it's uh, Roberto, one of our sculptors, and he, yeah, yeah. He, he's bringing some of the stuff uh, to life. Oh, so technology, right? It's great until it is and right. <laughs> uh, So, what are your feelings when you see one of your drawings materialize into a physical model? So it's not just uh, oh, to the art; it's yeah. a sculpt now. So, what are your feelings in there? Like uh, we were talking right now about uh, well, Aureus and from Elise, right, from Lords of Bala, to seeing your. Your design, your idea, I know this one is from Steve, but uh, mm. seeing it like now as a physical miniature, people painting it and, uh, well, making the, that design uh, them because yeah. well, they are their, their personal touch, right? Right. It's um, That feeling is something that I can't even begin to describe, <laughs> to be honest. It's, uh, it's an amazing feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. Um, I love... Uh, working with other people, I love working with other with other artists, and seeing my work get passed to another artist, another craftsperson, another uh, another skilled individual, and see them kind of give the same love and attention to my designs that I gave in coming up to that design is it's such an honor. Um, and Roberto, by the way, uh, awesome work on on those designs. I love the stuff that you've been doing for for uh, for Draco. And uh, it, 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 like I said, it's every time I see a sculpt come to life, every time I see that two-dimensional concept become a three-dimensional uh, object, um, it's just huge heartfelt feeling. I, I, I absolutely love it. Uh, it never gets old, ever. Heartfelt I have feeling. here. I, uh, I, I absolutely I, love it. I, uh, I, I want to share. Uh, so we have Nagasha here. Uh, I'm not sure if, if Gabo is helping me to share so we can see my screen. Uh, so one of the scopes that I have here too is like we have the physical, uh, sorry, the, the art there. And then we have this scope here. Uh, remember Fantastic. that Nagasha, it's one of the dragons that are going to come out in, uh, in Lords of Bala. And it's also one of the dragons in Battles of Balerna. So this miniature is actually from Battles of Balerna. So she's a, a grown up Nagasha, while in Lords of Bala, we're going to have the younger versions of Perlo, Nagasha, Adail, and Elise. And I have a question here also. Uh, what did you meant with safe universes? And why did you like the weird, unique, uniqueness of Dragon Bond? Uh, they send it oh, privately, yeah. so, so I didn't say it in, 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 in yeah, here. Yeah. So yeah, that's what one I, of the questions. What I love, what I love about, about, about Dragon Bond, right, is that we're, we're going, we're, we're pulling some, uh, some aspects from traditional fantasy worlds, right? We're, we're getting swords and sorcery and magic and stuff. But for the most part, we're trying to steer clear of some of those tired tropes uh, in the Dragon Bond setting. So, um, you know, dwarves with Scottish accents, um, super pasty elves, um, like all that stuff is kind of out the window. And that's why I love this setting so much is that we're, we're not really worried about, um, we're, we're worried about showing reverence and respect to where these, these subjects came from but we're not feeling tethered to kind of keep going with those old tropes. So uh, what's, that's what's, what I love about this team is that the entire team from the very beginning has, has uh, always embraced that. And, um, you know, if you look at uh, um, factions like uh, Alaria, for instance, uh, there's a lot of elves and half elves in Alaria, um, but it's not all, you know, just uh, a pale, blonde haired, tall, uh, pointy eared, individual you know like we have different body types we have different uh different skin tones uh different personalities with these like everyone's an individual in this setting and uh and it's very uh evocative of the real world in that in, in that regard and that's why i i really love really love this uh this setting and working on it 
I can imagine those because I have seen everything like what we are sharing right now and we can share, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to be shared eventually. So stay tuned for this. And uh, one of the also, well, I have Aldo, uh, Aldo Dominguez, one of uh, our art director also with, with uh, Dragon Bond saying like, which is the best Dragon Bond dragon and why is Sivax? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but we all know it's uh, Aureus. But uh, moving forward, is what uh, what advice would you give anyone wanting to be an artist? How how do they start? Uh, so so to start is uh, is it's super easy to start, and uh, and the instructions for how to get there are also super easy, but a little more difficult uh, to to actually follow through. To start, just pick up a pencil. Uh, just start drawing, uh, and to become an artist, don't stop. Uh, and that's the part that sounds like it's simple, but it's not. Um, there's so many things that can kind of get in the way on that path. Um, and for the most part, they're usually um, kind of in the artist's own head, to be honest. Uh, artists are our own worst enemies sometimes, right? That self-doubt that kind of that kind of whispers in our ear. If there's any aspiring artists out there right now, they're all nodding their heads. Um, I, I could promise, I could promise us all that. Uh, but yeah, that, there's that little bit of self-doubt. There's the external doubt you know from people saying stuff like um oh you know get a more serious career or or uh or th this is never going to pan out kind of deal so a lot of it is is just kind of resilience and uh and res and while you're practicing that resilience uh building your skills up as you go um just never stop learning keep drawing keep pushing yourself ask yourself how do i keep getting better uh and never get content with where you're at always look around and because there's always somebody else that's better than you out there and that shouldn't be a point of um, kind of a point of despair, but rather think of that as a point to kind of be excited about it, right? There's always something new to learn, somebody new to learn from. Uh, so for me, I'm always looking at new artists, people who, uh, people who are better than me always. Oh man, I love looking at people who are better than me because it pushes me to do better myself. So look to people who are better, people that inspire you, keep learning and just uh, keep drawing uh, as you go. Don't let, uh, don't let anything stop you. That's awesome. <laughs> and one of the things that I love about Dragon Bond is that, uh, well, we have some uh, artists that are coming uh, from like from fresh, like, for example, Aldo here. Uh, yeah. Let me just show some of his art. Like we love what he did with Siberia and uh, Alaria from from some of the cards. Right. This is Harvest and yep. this is Assault from Tiberia. So I think it's it's just a sneak peek of what is coming with exactly. uh, the Dragon Bond universe from. Uh, oh, great. I have no. All those, ha. all those fantastic at what he Technology, does. Technology, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, da, da, da. For some weird reason, I stopped hearing you, but it's me. Don't worry. Uh, so, oh, no. <laughs> before moving forward, is what are you working on now? So, what surprises are for, for oh, man. From Dragon Ball? Um, so, so. Uh... I could talk about what I'm working on with Dragon Bond. Not, <laughs> I'm working on uh, some some other fun stuff too. But uh, in regards to Dragon Bond, um, I'm trying to think of what I can give away and what I can't give away here, Pam. Um, we've got a lot of cool stuff around the corner here. Uh, we're okay talking about the Hollow Depths, right? Can I can I drop that? What we've got going on there? <laughs> so we're we're working on a really cool setting right now uh, with Dragon Bond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Referred yeah, to sure. as the uh, the hollow depths. Um, so the hollow depths are kind of. I, I don't want to refer to it as the underdark because it's way different from the underdark. It's more of like a hollow earth meets the underdark kind of vibe going on with it. And uh, and I'm going to be working with um, with uh, Darken um, from uh, you may know him from Magic the Gathering and Wiz uh, other Wizards of the Coast properties. Um, I'll be working with Darken to uh, kind of concept up some really fun stuff with that. He's done some wonderful stuff for us in the past. Um, and we actually have a uh, yeah. Pam's got some awesome images right here that she can share the hollow depths too. We have a, a couple that we've already contracted some artists out to uh, to explore. The hollow depths are filled with these. Uh, uh, yeah, these we really have crazy, awesome, awesome here. Demons. Yeah, awesome is awesome. So this is uh, this is made up by uh, Felice Berberin, uh, uh, Philippe Berberin, um, who you guys may know from uh, again Magic the Gathering uh, work. He concepted up a couple uh, of these fantastic demons for us. Um, we also have a, a few other demons um, and monsters. We've got this uh, these fun darklings, uh, these these kind of gnome dwarf goblin hybrids with these cool mushroom growths on them uh, that uh, were designed up by Jeff Miracola. This uh, one coming up here is one of my absolute favorites, uh, designed up by Steve Prescott. So we have this just this crazy, almost uh, 
you know, there, there's this whimsical uh, aspect to it, but there's this underlying scariness to it all too. It's almost like Alice in Wonderland if it were darker and scarier almost, right? Like there's these whimsical mushrooms and, and glowing bioluminescence, but then there's this underlying uh, danger uh, to it all with the with the Dimos, which are these uh, demons. Uh, and then you have things like these crime lords here, uh, this giant obese creepy toad guy who uh, who drinks the memories of his victims and all. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a wild setting. It's going to be a really fun, wild <laughs> setting with a really great group uh, in there. And like I mentioned, uh, we've had a lot of artists working on it. Uh, Eric Gist, uh, Steve Prescott, um, Jason Engel has done a lot of fun stuff for us as well. And then uh, moving into the next phase, we're going to have uh, Darken helping us round out that whole thing and, uh, and kind of wrapping up with, the, uh, with that creepy vibe that I was mentioning, helping us hit that. Uh, talking about that, uh, I have a, one of the questions here. Uh, which are the other artists that are working with you in Dragon Ball? I know that we have uh, uh, it's Lucas, Gra Lucas Graciano working with this one I have in here. Yes. Great Wins of Draca. Awesome. Uh, I think it's great. Uh, but we have a strip, a Steve Prescott. We have, uh, Duncan, as you mentioned, been off in Sicaria. So can you talk a little bit more about them? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got... Um... As, as Pam mentioned, a, a huge amount of artists working with and a, and a fantastic group of artists, too. Um, these are a lot of folks that I've met over the years at conventions and really gotten to know um, as, as people and as artists. You know, they're just a, a great group of individuals. So um, we've got, uh, like Pam mentioned, Jason Engel, um, Eric Gist, uh, Darkin, uh, working on the Hollow Depths for us. Uh, Tyler Walpole uh, designed up our Yisval faction for us which is this awesome uh, faction of these um, almost um, Norse, uh, Norse paladins, you can almost think of them as, like Northern paladins, drawing on a lot of uh, Sami uh, peoples for inspiration in there. So Tyler did a fantastic job designing those up, as well as some really cool giants as well. Um, we've had uh, Vinod uh, Rams uh, working with us uh, to design up these really cool uh, sea elves, these aqua elves uh, that live off the, uh, the coasts of, uh, of Valerna. Uh, really, really great stuff that he designed up for us there. Um, yeah, just a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic group of artists. Tumo Mare, who, uh, Let's see if I can who find him. Yeah, we got some fun stuff in here. Let's see. Uh, let's. What do we got? Ah, awesome. Yeah, here's Vinod's stuff. Some really great, cool, um, really cool monsters that he designed up for us here. These chimeras that he did. Let's see if that sucker lands. Uh, I'm Photoshop documents always are, are tricky. <laughs> I'm waiting for them to load, but they are not loading. So, oh, there you there go. We, we go. have the Seaver yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> so this, yeah, this is an example yeah. of one of the things that uh, Vinod uh, designed up for us. These sea bears, which are really fantastic. Um, really cool, cool concept. These are uh, a sentient species that lives in uh, Valerna, uh, native to it, um, that live on the coasts. They're kind of uh, almost, you can think of them like a cross between polar bears and elephant seals, sort of, right? These giant marine mammals that uh, that frequent the ice flows out there uh, in certain areas of the uh, of the ocean. So this is this is what I'm talking about when I say that we do some really cool, weird stuff. This kind of thing, like I, I love the type of uh, the type of directions that uh, that my team are willing to go with me uh, on these on these uh, these concept explorations. <laughs> I have one of the questions here uh, from the team. Well, from our backers, Jose is asking, how do you approach companies to show them your work and try to work with them? Great question. Uh, yeah. I know probably they reach out to you, but if you are starting any tips, and I think this question fits with the one that Aldo did. Just one second, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a, an artist that guide you when you started, like the same way you support him. Yes, okay, yeah, so, um... So the way, the way that I would um, recommend uh, kind of getting out there and getting your, your name kind of known to all the companies that you want to work for, um, uh, the first thing is uh, get good, right? So like I mentioned, uh, keep drawing, get your skills up and everything, um, and put together a small portfolio. And uh, my advice would be have, a company, uh, have, have companies in mind, specific companies in mind that you want to work for, and find them at conventions. Uh, when convention season kicks back up, I know that this is like terrible advice for the past year, obviously, but um, when convention season kicks back up and everything uh, across the world and all, 
Um, go to those conventions, bring your portfolio there, find those art directors to talk to. Um, a lot of companies will actually have portfolio re portfolio reviews at conventions. So uh, if you check the convention websites ahead of time, you can find out if certain companies are giving portfolio reviews and you can sign up for those reviews. Uh, and then um, talk to them, show those art directors your, your work. Uh, thank, uh, and honestly, every time that, that I've ever seen anybody talk to an art director, it's super rare to get work off the first visit. So after you talk to them that first time, go back home, take their advice, because they're going to give you advice on your portfolio. Take your, their advice, work on your portfolio, apply that advice, and see them at the next convention and at the next convention. And this is where it comes in where I say don't quit, right? Because it's, it's about getting to know the art directors and the art directors getting to trust you. They need to understand that you're in this and you want to do this and you can do this. Uh, and they need to take a gamble with a new artist. You know, um, That's kind of the way it works. So you need to show them that you're willing to apply their feedback and all. So um, applying their feedback after those reviews, going to find them again, and then targeting that portfolio to that product that they're doing. So if I want to work for D&D, &D, for instance, um, I'm not going to fill it up with, uh, with um, my portfolio up with pictures of uh, Luke Skywalker and his lightsaber, right? I want to make sure that that's catered specifically to D&D at that point in time. So show them that you know what, uh, what their product is, that you know what they're, um, what they're producing <laughs> and, what, and the type of stuff that they want, and, uh, and show them that, that, you're, that you're in it uh, for the long haul. Um, apply that feedback and keep going time and again, and eventually they're going to they're gonna drop you an email or give you a ring. That's really cool. Uh, talking about a little bit of D and D that you just mentioned, we know that you did this amazing new yeah. Yamat. So, what can you tell about uh, this one? I know that it's a <laughs> miniature too. Uh, I know that you have been working with miniature. also one of our sculptors and art a creative director, Erli, with yep. uh, White Drake. So, how yeah. does that feel? <laughs> uh, amazing. <laughs> so, as I, as you mentioned before, like somebody asked, um, I think it was Roberto asked. Uh, how it feels to actually see your stuff in, in three dimensions, right? See it come alive. <laughs> and um, and this specifically, designing Tiamat probably was a, a career highlight for me um, up to this point. Uh, as a kid, like I mentioned, I super was into D&D, &D, like loved D&D &D growing up as a, as a kid and uh, and loved miniatures, you know? Like I would buy all the Raul Partha, little lead Raul Partha miniatures from a uh, from my old comic book store, Dreamland Comics 2, over in Libertyville, if anybody knows it. Um, <laughs> I would go to uh, to my comic shop and buy all the little Raul Partha miniatures and everything. So um, now as an adult being asked to contribute to that miniature range <laughs> with the biggest mini miniature that's ever been created for D&D um, is, a, is a crazy honor, a crazy honor. And uh, like you mentioned, we've uh, I've been working a lot with, uh, with Early, uh, Daniel, uh, who's a member of the Draco team. He's uh, the creative director and does a lot of the sculptures for the team as well. He um, he's been working at, with me and uh, WizKids on the uh, on the dragon line as well. Um, he's he actually sculpted the chromatic dragons. Uh, for those of you who have seen the icons of the realm chromatic dragons, we've got the the white dragon here that's sculpted up by uh, by our creative lead over at Draco. Um, and yeah, it's it's just it's great to be able to kind of um, create these fantastic uh, worlds with these people that I admire and respect and uh, man, just, just love their work. I geek out over their work all the time. And then to be able to, to go with those same people over and to basically do, um, do fan art. That's not fan art, right? It's official stuff, <laughs> but we're both fans of it. Uh, it's, it's just such a, a fantastic feeling, um, creating new worlds. And then at the same time, going with those same people and making, you know, uh, the stuff that inspired us even better for the next generation to inspire those people going forward. That's awesome to hear. Uh, actually, I'm showing right now the the board game from Lords of Bala, that the, mm. the new next step from from yeah, Dragon Bond. We're gonna have, like I mentioned previously, the the younger versions from Perlon, Nagasha. Uh, I have them also in here. Here is Nagasha. Awesome. Uh, we can see Perlon, Elise, and Adrael. Uh, so what can you tell us a little bit about uh, Lords of Bala? What are your impressions from the board game? Uh, the, 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 well, the, the dynamics, mm. the, how, how did you feel it? I know that you tested previously. So I did, what are yeah. your comments about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, want to, I want to preface this by saying this is totally not a plug. Like the board game's super fun. Like I, I had such a blast playing this. Um, as Pat mentioned, I ended up, uh, I, I, I had the opportunity to play test this with the, uh, with the team a couple months back. Um, when we were commissioning out the artwork for it. Um, knowing how the game works, the game dynamics go, 
uh, affects the artwork for this stuff. So you kind of have to know how it goes, you know? Um, so I, I wanted to go ahead and play test the game with everybody. We, we got on the uh, tabletop simulator on Steam and we all played, uh, played around and, um, oh, it's so much fun. It's so intuitive, so fast paced. And the way that, that, that certain aspects work specifically, I, I love the spell aspects of it. Like that was my favorite part. Um, so much fun. But, uh, but yeah, it, it's a great game. Uh, the visuals came out. I'm so happy with the way the visuals came out for it as well. Like, you, you know, you have the Nagasha miniature up here right now, too. And that was so much fun trying to take those designs that we had and figure out how to make them feel younger, you know, like younger versions of those dragons. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I cannot wait. Cannot wait to, to actually get my hands on, on a physical copy of this game because it was such a blast to play. And, again, seeing all this stuff come together is just, oh, I get so giddy. I get so excited. <laughs> Well, actually, you are right now working on the prototypes and everything, so we're super excited to try it physical because it's not, it's really good in, in Tabletopia and Tabletop Simulator, but as you mentioned, the best right. thing to do is like to use it and move your dragon and then add and yeah. I personally love playing as a dragon. Right. And, uh, well, one of the other uh, questions that uh, any, any words that, that, well, any any words or advice that you will share to the backers expecting to join the Dragon Bond universe, the Kickstarter uh, launching on August second? Uh, any words of advice for those looking to to join? Um, I'm with uh, so words of advice if you're if you're joining on for the board game, uh, pick a dragon when you play. Like Pam said, it's super mm -hmm. fun and you can fly and you get to eat people. So uh, that's my words of advice when you're playing the game itself. <laughs> But uh, but no, when when you when you guys do end up picking up this game and, and everybody's able to get this uh, uh, in their hands and everything to play it, um, I hope that you all like right there. I can see the little Elise card on there. I hope that you all dig the visuals for it. So take a moment to take a look at the visuals that we've really laid out on this. Um, the creative team and I did a lot of thinking on on how to best optimize the visuals for this game, and we think we came up with something really special. And I hope that you guys dig it too. The in-house team did a fantastic job. Irene, shout out. To Huge shout out to Irene, to, to Fair, and to Aldo for all the hard work they did. Adam as well, awesome stuff, Adam. Um, they, uh, I just, I can't wait for you guys to see everything that they've put together on this. Please take a second and, and look over those visuals because they are awesome. Yeah, and I think one of the super cool stuff that we're gonna show you here, as you mentioned, play a dragon and everything, is that you have different, uh, well, you, you can play as a dragon, as a general, as a general, you need to <laughs> conquer, uh, all the, the territories that you can see in here, like uh, and collect the power from there, so you can cast Bala Bala decks. And as I mentioned previously, you will have a unique Bala deck depending on your general. So it will be yeah. Nagasha, Ferelon, Elite, or Adael. Or with the stretch goals, we can unlock more generals depending, like an Ogeron or uh, a Killing Warden, or stuff like that. And I think that's great. Uh, another question. Let me just check if I'm not jumping anyone in here. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I have one question here. Did you add something personal to each of your creations? Like, for example, an architect sometimes, I, I just watch a movie where the architect hide a photo from him <laughs> and his uh, wife in the chimney. So do you mark <laughs> your creations? No, I don't. So I actually, I used to kind of have an idea to do that for a while. Um, I have a, a buddy of mine who's, uh, he's, he's practically like a family. Uh, my buddy, Eric Gist. Um, he, when he first started doing illustrations, would always hide a wishbone in all of his illustrations. Like if there was a big explosion, he'd put like a little like little wishbone in there with all the debris uh, flying out, or he'd like hide a wishbone like in a pile of refuse in a corner. Um, I considered doing that, and like I I, I started to do it. I, I always used to try to hide a bird in all of my pieces somewhere, um, whether it was a little pattern in a scale or something like that that was totally unrecognizable. But as I did it more and more, I was like, no, I really want to try to like double down with with these universes you know so i wanted to play with with uh with the in-universe stuff so instead of trying to sneak in um little kind of uh uh winks to people who might be looking for them what i would do what i do instead now is actually try to sneak in in-universe references in my in my stuff so it's not personal things but it's stuff that the sharp-eyed viewer might pick up if they understand the lore of things like that um for instance um uh, one of my more popular pieces that i've done is uh, in the fifth edition player uh, handbook. I think, yeah, the player handbook for D&D. &D. Uh, in the elf section, it's a full page picture of an elf. Um, she's opening a secret door and she has her, her staff and her little rat familiar on top of her staff. Uh, if you look at it, 
She has the uh, the Harper's symbol peeking out from underneath her robe. She has a little medallion of the Harper's uh, symbol there. And then the wall that she's opening up has a stylized symbol of the Xanathar's Guild on it. So you actually have a member of the Harper's, which is an organization in the Forgotten Realm setting, breaking into one of the safe houses, one of the portal houses for the Xanathar's Guild, which is uh, this evil organization that operates out of, where is it, Waterdeep, I think? Um, so yeah, like I love doing little stuff like that. I love sneaking in little in-world references. So if you look at Dragon Bond art, if you look at the stuff that, uh, that I've done for Dragon Bond, um, things like uh, the Boo Centauri, for instance, which are these really cool uh, bull centaurs that we've got in the in Ilaria. I'll go ahead and I'll sneak in little nods to Ilaria in there. So these guys, um, the Boo Centauri, they're kind of independent tribes uh, that are in this um, alliance with Ilaria. And they lend their support, their military support to it and all. But they're not part of the the main military structure. They have their own aesthetics, their own vibe and everything. So I sneak in little hints of their Alarian allegiance there. So repeating the number four, the, the symbol of Alaria is a four-headed hydra. So you'll see a lot of the, uh, uh, the number four repeated over there, whether it's sets of four objects, four points on things, four dragon heads, four hydra heads. It's always repeated in there. So um, it's not personal things that I sneak in. It's more in-world setting things that I try to kind of slide in. Oh, here's an awesome Bu Centauri from, uh, from Aldo. Um, one of our uh, our in-house uh, concept artists and art directors. Um, man, that's gorgeous. Again, I, so right here, <laughs> uh, good example. The four uh, the four points on this, right? We've got the the two horns, and then we have the stylized headdress going back with the hair there, with the two points in the back. So you have the four heads of the hydra there. So a great example right there of Aldo inserting in that in-world uh, nod to uh, to to uh, to an aspect in the Dragon Bond universe. Exactly what I'm talking about. I love that, Aldo. I love that so much. <laughs> that makes me so happy. I love it. For you, uh, what makes the Dragon Bond universe unique in, in, in your own words? Like, it's one of the also yeah. uh, one of the questions that the team has. So what makes a uh, Dragon Bond a fantasy setting, uh, a fantasy setting unique, a unique fantasy setting? <laughs> Sorry. It's, you know, no, you're, you're good. This is kind of, uh, uh, this is going to be a little bit of an overlap from uh, one of the um, questions that, uh, that somebody asked earlier, too. Um, because it's, it's sort of the same answer. For me, it's like right here, what you're looking at with this Bucentari that we've got. Um, that's what makes it unique to me, is that we go kind of off the beaten path. We have this sort of high fantasy aesthetic to the realm where we sort of push beyond the, um, you know, feathered archer hat and pointy shoes and knight's armor. We go, we go beyond that to, to kind of wade into that high fantasy realm. Um, Stuff that you'd see in, say, like, uh, you know, Magic the Gathering, Dragon Prince, stuff like that. A little higher fantasy aesthetic. But um, we also, as I mentioned, we don't feel like we have to be tethered to uh, all dwarves are red-haired and have Scottish accents and drink beer, you know? Like, we, we go off the beaten path with that stuff, and that's what I love about it. I have a question for you right now about the, those, about the culture and everything. So how do you adapt the culture, design, and costumes of the different kingdoms that have been created in Dragon Bond, such as Nahuatl? Because I know Nahuatl have some influences from uh, Mexican, well, not Mexican, but Mayan cultures. Uh, yes. Then we have Alaria with some Elvish, but at the same time, some Chinese. Uh, Isabel mm -hmm. from Viking. So how, how do you uh, adapt everything? I know, well, well for as for Drag Studios, we know that we have all the cultural consultants and everything, but how you understand our president, uh, Dan, Dan Ideas, and put them on, on paper, right? And, and make right. him say like, oh, you totally know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you, tra yeah, how do you, how do you know what to take from where and translate it and kind of funnel it down into all this? Um, that's, a, that's an awesome question because um, for those of you who are listening and, and aren't quite sure of how the creative process goes, um, sure. what Pam was kind of referring to, uh, Dan, uh, company president, has these just stellar ideas, right? And it's all about getting those ideas to visuals. So um, it all starts with like loose ideas, loose visuals, uh, basic ideas. And then from there, what uh, like Pam said, what I like to kind of do is reach for the cultures that are kind of inspiring each of these areas. So um, our writing team uh, and, and, our, and our team, uh, in-house team over at Draco, will have an idea of what something will uh, kind of lean towards. For instance, Alaria, like you mentioned. Um, Pam, you mentioned Alaria has a lot of Chinese influences in it. Um, from, uh, from historical uh, Chinese uh, costumes and weaponry and, and things like that. So we'll lean on that. We'll start, that, uh, start with that as a jumping point. And we'll try to basically um, find interesting shape designs and interesting things that are kind of evocative of that kind of, uh, that, that kind of Eastern feel, right? 
Uh, but then going beyond that, we want to create something that's not just kind of a uh, kind of a, a restructuring of Chinese aesthetic, right, or Eastern aesthetic. We don't just want to redo it and kind of take this specific sword and just put it on an elf with pointy ears. We want to redo that a little bit too. So it's almost like what we do is try to find a common visual language with the civilizations and with the uh, inspirations uh, that we're pulling from in our own uh, concept art. So uh, similar to how I'm saying with this Bu Centauri, I'm trying to think of a good way to, to try to, to give a good analogy for this. So with the Bu Centauri, you know, I mentioned how we repeat those four uh, shapes over and over, the four heads of the Hydra. We try to repeat the number four as a mo visual motif in that. What we like to do at, at Draco uh, when I'm working with my art team is look at those cultures that inspire us and try to find a common visual motif with those cultures. So it doesn't just become a parody of a culture. It doesn't just become kind of a ripoff of that culture. It becomes its own thing that shares visual language. So it still is evocative of that and kind of gives a nod to it, but it becomes its own thing in its, uh, in its own right at the same time. Hopefully that made sense. I know that, that was a, like a lot of jargon and, and concept words thrown out there, <laughs> but I think that that might give an idea of, uh, of kind of the process and how it goes for you all. I, I actually, yeah, yeah, I was trying to find Alaria here, mm. but I couldn't find it, so uh, I, I, I will search for that one uh, later. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Busatari, that's, that's uh, Alaria right there, the, too, Let so. me just check if I'm not skipping anyone. Uh, Jose, I think that uh, answers also the question about where the, the research, what kind of research you do. Mm, yeah, lo lots. Uh, I have a question from <laughs> Alex. When it comes to lore, how much will you show and develop of the non-military elements? Things outside of the battlefields and warriors, like different farming systems, cities, traders. Uh, yes, 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 yes. So, so this, oh man, that's a great question because <laughs> that's exactly what we're working on right now with Draco. Uh, so the in-house team right now, um, under Aldo's eye, uh, Aldo, you're doing a fantastic job with it. It's looking so good. Uh, we're developing up uh, essentially everything that you just mentioned. We're figuring out what the cultures of Alaria look like. Oh, sorry about that. We had a cord slip over here. We're figuring out what the cultures of Alaria look like outside of the battlefield, because what a culture develops outside of battle is really what sets up what they look like <laughs> in battle, right? Uh, so here, a great example right here. We have uh, variations of the traditional Alarian block cut dress. Um, this refers to kind of this, this vertical sort of rectangular shape in the silhouette that we have to this individual. So. Here's um, what would be considered kind of a higher up on the pecking order of a, of Alaria. Some more, uh, more um, you know, higher tier, noble-ish clothing uh, of the Alarian citizens that you may see just walking down the average street in Alaria. Um, things like the parasol and stuff like that. That's the stuff that I love to see the concept artists kind of put in there because those are everyday items. You know, like they're not, not everything needs to be about swords and shields and spears and magic casting. There's got to be everyday items in there somewhere, and uh, and those everyday items are the things that really inform those wartime items. So in a way, it's almost more essential to kind of understand what that looks like, so you can inform those uh, those really cool, you know, badass uh, tabletop miniatures uh, with uh, with better decisions, better design decisions, because you know the cultures that they're coming from. That's, that's really cool. Actually, uh, I'm showing right now one of uh, our, of the Sinotes from Nahuac, and I think these are one of the, the of the like my personal favorite. Well, I, I love Isval, but taking mm -hmm. Nahuac with all the Mayan stuff with the Sinotes and yeah. a, a lot happening in there with with the lore, the seals, the the Shibak that you just uh, show us. Yep. So yeah, all, all the lore in there, it's it's great. Yeah, now now is is a fantastic one. You know, Pam, you actually, I, I think that in my rambles, it's hard I, to follow uh, up with all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, so I think yeah, I actually missed they, they agree. It's a the fantastic Nawa. answer. Oh, sorry. I think that you were mentioning something. <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought you had a question. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to just show a little bit about the other aisle and Elise. Uh, these are the, the ones also from, from Aldo. So what, what can you, no, no, no. Like what, what can you mention about the magic from like the different magics from Dragon Ball? We have blood magic yeah. in Israel. We have the Macav and all these nature from Nawak, the dream shaping in Elise. Yeah. So what are your thoughts about that? So yeah, so the magic systems are, are incredibly 
cool and and i love the magic systems because of the visuals that we came up with them right like when i play rpgs i'm i'm always the dude who has like the big two-handed hammer type deal like i i love my 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 brute force and my and my melee weapons but i love the visuals of magic so so much and with dragon bond we came up with this cool idea to kind of separate the different types of magics with different types of visuals for them so we have dream shaping magic here with elise where we have these uh, it's almost like a, a flowing fractal kind of uh, design that we have to it, where you have these flowing lines, but then they're kind of broken up by these uh, by these fractalish shapes that are happening in there. We saw the blood magic with Adriel previously, uh, where we had this kind of capillary shapes happening to the blood magic, where it kind of branches out almost like uh, like blood vessels or capillaries, which is really cool. Uh, and then the macabre magic, which is uh, from Nawa, where we have this really cool. Uh, macabre based uh, this really cool almost nature based magic system where they have these awesome little glowy stones that are embedded into these uh, stone bracelets that uh, that are really evocative of uh, like like uh, Pam was saying that Mayan uh, vibe that we were kind of shooting for with them and everything so it pairs up really cool with the headdresses that we've got um, really really fun stuff the visuals are just oh they're so slick <laughs> like look at that I love I love that blood magic uh, on Adriel how we have like the the Blood magic branching off, and they can form these really cool like spears and everything that come on down. Love that stuff. That's that's great. And actually, uh, talking about one of the things that I was asked before is mm. if you were able to live in Dragon Bond universe for for one year, uh, which will be your home realm, right? Oh man! Uh, like See? I personally know that it will be Isabel, but for you, which one will be like? We we have a lot of realms in there. We have Sicaria. We have Altanesi. But oh, like there's from so many. the four realms that we have talked about, Alaria, Nahuac, Israel, and uh, Siberia, which one will be your home? Oh, man, so so Nahuac's going to just be, like, that's too humid for me. So, like, that's not going to work. Um, Tiberia, <laughs> I mean, Tiberia might be a little too intense for me and not, not laid back enough. Uh, you know, I, I think it's either going to be, like, a, there's something, like, nice and kind of mellow about Alaria. Uh, but I mean, I'm an outdoors guy, so I think it's going to be Yisfall. I think I'm going to go up there in Yisfall and kind of just take off with the giants and the pints into the woods and hang out with them. Yeah, Yisfall, definitely. And the more I think about it, yep. <laughs> I'll live in the forest talking with the giants and Isbel. the pints. Oh, okay. Talking about Yisfall, I just want to show, like, Dragon Bond is a deep, deep, deep uh, universe with a lot of stuff. And here's a sneak peek of what we're planning. Like, this is Raxor. Uh, what, what, what can you tell us, Tom, that uh, what, what is coming up for, for Dragon Bond? Oh, it's man. not so, just Lords of Bala, but there's an expansion, right? And Isbal, Nahuatl, Garia. There Nawa, is. Gadia, there Nawa, is some Lords Nawa, of... What can you tell us? See, you're giving me permission now to, to jump into all this stuff. I'm going to spill all the beans now, Pam. Um, so we've got, uh, like Pam said, we've got expansions coming up for the, uh, for the, for the Lords of Valla, uh, our, our Battle of Valerna uh, board game. <laughs> and uh, what that looks like are the other realms that you're going to see happening. So... We've got Raxor here, which is uh, the dragon who ends up bonding with uh, with one of our Yisfall characters that you're going to meet. But Yisfall itself is this super cool kingdom uh, up north. So it's this colder place. Uh, it's got uh, uh, it's this kind of devout paladin kind of vibe to it. We've got a lot of uh, priests and paladins that happen uh, up there. A lot of heavier armor, so it's a very heavy faction, right? It's got this very armored, heavy weighted feel to it. Uh, the, the warriors are riding these huge, giant, like, mountain ram kind of goat creatures, uh, as well as just these massive griffins that uh, the Tyler Walpole designed up for us. These super cool griffins that are kind of a mix between a sea eagle and a, uh, and a smilodon. We actually reached into, uh, into paleontology for the inspiration on this, and we're using saber-toothed cats as the basis for our griffins to get griffins that kind of felt big enough, muscular enough, heavy enough to kind of carry that fully armored paladin into battle. So um, really cool stuff. And then with that, with all of that stuff, these so those paladins and everything, those are settlers to this land, right? So as I mentioned before, I would pick Yisfal as kind of where I would want to live because the natural people who, who lived in Yisfal before and helped them out were these really cool races of giants and, uh, and our version of halflings, which we refer to as pints. They're... Um, kind of inspired by the old school Huldra folk from Norse mythology. So they have these kind of um, uh, kind of a weird sprite kind of feel to them almost, right? Um, little little gnomish, little halfling-ish, but uh, they have this cool forest creature look that kind of syncs up really well with their larger cousins, the uh, the the giants here that you see from Yisfal. So yeah, really cool stuff. Um, these guys will come out of the woods in times of need and kind of help the, uh, 
the paladins out when the when when the time arises. Yeah. One of the things I love about Isval are the pins. They are like my favorite race. I, I know that they like yeah. the, the, the one that you show the, the cooker. I'm trying to, to find it, but I couldn't find it in here. I will show it in a bit. But yeah, the pins I think they are great. They're Actually, awesome. some of you have used some of you have seen the pins in the previous Kickstarter campaign, Battles of Valerna for 3D Printable 5 for the war game, but there's also like the war game coming. So that's that's great. Uh, we're almost close to the hour, so I don't wanna uh, extend this interview. Let me just check if we have any other questions from uh, backers. Oh, I have one really interesting from Dragons. Uh, I know the legendary dragons have some breath magic attacks as optional parts of their models already, but, oh, no, that wasn't a question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Alex tricked me and the state model was. Oh, will you take a leaf, a leaf out of Great Worms and do endless spells type models? And do what type models? Endless spell type models? Uh, well, I get, that's up to Draco, but I would love to. <laughs> I'm totally game for that, yeah. Uh, it's endless spells, yeah. Yeah, I, I, that'd be super fun. Um, I think that'd be cool, but that's, again, that's uh, totally up to Draco, uh, whether or not those will make it into the game. But we've got so many cool things that are kind of in the works right now that um, it's it's one of those things where if you kind of keep your eye on what we're doing, you're going to see, everyone's going to probably see something that that checks a, a box off their list of what they want coming out of Draco here in the near future. There's a lot of really cool stuff happening here. Ah, oh, pints, awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm showing right now the pint because I, I was able to find it. This is the bard pint and I, I, I love him. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just and, a, a uh, beautiful concept. Aldo, Aldo wants cool. to keep going and going. <laughs> 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 so Tom, thank you so much for, for everything, like for all the, the insight, all the, the tips, the, the advice. Uh, I don't know if you have any other comments regarding the Kickstarter, the Lords of Bala before ending this. Yeah. Um, most like I said before, please guys, uh, keep your eyes out for for that campaign and make sure you're you're backing it and everything. I'm so incredibly proud of the work that the team did on this. Um, like I, I'm I'm happy with my work that I did on it. It's cool and all, but man, the team really all came together and made a, a just a stellar pro a stellar product. Um, everybody did some really cool stuff, and I and I can't wait to share what everybody did with all of you out there. So um, pick it up, check it out, and. Um, let me know what you think of the artwork when you do, because uh, the team put their all into it, and it's uh, and it shows. It really does. It's it's a very special game, and I can't wait to 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 show it to everybody. You know. Thank you so much, Tom. Actually, uh, I forgot to mention uh, previously, but Lords of Bala is being designed by Rivercourse, Alessio Cavatore, and Jack Caesar. So we're gonna have an interview too with them possibly next week. So uh, we're super excited about that, and thank you for everything, Tom. So. Of course. Uh, see you in the Kickstarter. Probably we will have another interview uh, about how is it going and the, 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 yeah. well, the new art that we are working on. And again, from everyone here, thank you so much and have a great day, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for having me, everybody. Good talking to you.